All right, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming tonight. Welcome. My name is Brandon Hoving, and I'm meteorologist at the National Weather Service in Grand Rapids, and uh, also president of this new chapter, uh, the Southwest Michigan chapter of the American Meteorological Society and National Weather Association. Say that five times fast. Well, it'll be tricky. Um, but we're newly founded, um, as you can see, just last fall. Uh, elected board members and, and passed some bylaws and, and wanted to get involved on the local level uh, with these national organizations uh, for meteorologists and weather enthusiasts alike. So with that, let's uh, go ahead and get started. <clears throat> Just some of the things we're going to be covering tonight. Obviously, as you know, we'll have the presentation uh, from Nathan about National Weather Service support of the Marshall oil spill that happened last summer down in Marshall. Um, so I'll introduce the board members here in a minute. Uh, I'll, I'll kind of take you through a little timeline of how we got here as a chapter. Uh, talk about just a few goals that we have uh, as a local chapter. Uh, we'll also have a few comments about the blizzard of last week, which has impacted everybody in this room. <laughs> I will turn it over to Moss Ingram just for a few words. Uh, he's with the GRCC Sustainability Council. And I know we have a few uh, students here tonight as well, so welcome. We'll do the presentation. We'll have some time for questions, and uh, we'll do kind of a wrap-up uh, thing and, and a raffle drawing as well for those of you who may want to be interested in joining the chapter, um, perhaps serving on a committee or just kind of getting involved and getting to know us a little bit better, um, kind of as we evolve here in our first year as a, as a chapter here in Southwest Michigan. Um, so we are a regional chapter. Uh, we're meeting in Grand Rapids, obviously, tonight, but we would like to try to uh, rotate around a few different cities in southwest Michigan. Uh, so that may include Kalamazoo, uh, Lansing, uh, Muskegon, those kinds of places in the future. So with that being said, uh, I'd like to invite the board members up, up front here for introduction. <clears throat> So once again, I've already introduced myself, uh, Brandon Hoving, graduated from Central Michigan University in 2008 with a Bachelor of Science in Meteorology. And I uh, got an internship with the National Weather Service here in Grand Rapids in 2007, and then was hired in 2008 full time. And so that's where I currently am, and I love it. So I will hand it over to Nathan. Hello everyone, my name is Nathan DeRuzel and I'm a meteorologist at the National Weather Service here in Grand Rapids. My career started off in Alaska. I grew up here in Michigan, in Manistee, Michigan, and then went to Central Michigan University, graduated there uh, December of 1998, and then went up to Alaska for about three and a half years. That was my first job at the Weather Service. Up there I was also the vice president of the local AMS chapter. Uh, that was for about a couple of years while I was up there. And then back in August of 2002, moved here to Grand Rapids. Uh, my wife and I, and now our kids, want to be closer to our families. So we moved back here and love, love the West Michigan area. So I'll pass it on. My name's Rob Dale. I'm from Toledo. I'm a boiler maker. I, I uh, came back to Toledo and, and uh, was the president of the AMS chapter there. It was at one of those meetings that Paul Gross, or it's actually the Southeast Michigan chapter, Paul Gross said, hey, Lansing is hiring a TV guy. Um, so I worked in Lansing for the last 10 years as a, as a meteorologist. I'm now in emergency management because I got sick of the weekends and sick of the overnights. So I'm uh, an emergency manager at uh, Ingham Regional Medical Center in Lansing. I also do radio weather. Uh, but really, the AMS chapter networking is what got my job off the ground. Uh, it was not at all resumes or tapes because my first tapes were pretty bad. Uh, it was a group just like this uh, that met down at the U of M chapter. So we're really looking forward to what this group can do. I'm William Marino. I'm a forecast National Weather Service office in Grand Rapids also. And um, I started my career in the Air Force many, many years ago, back in 1976. I was in the Air Force for eight years. I served in the Air Weather Service, actually. And then I moved on into the National Weather Service in Detroit. And then I got a forecast job over here in Grand Rapids, and that's where I've been ever since. All right, thanks guys. Just kind of give you a little overview of how we got to this point. 
Uh, back in 2009, we just started some informal talks about forming a local chapter uh, with the AMS and NWA in southwest Michigan and started to get the ball rolling um, in August of last year. Uh, so we kind of sent out an email to some of the local meteorologists in the area to see what the interest was like and decided to go ahead with the plan, put in petitions uh, to, sent to the AMS and NWA. And that was approved pretty quick, which was uh, awesome. So we got approved last fall and then decided to uh, elect board members, our board here, uh, in December and approve the bylaws. So we spared you of going through the particulars of our Constitution. <laughs> so we'll get to the fun stuff tonight. And then here we are today. So just some of the things we hope to accomplish as a local chapter, um, if you're interested in joining us. Uh, we'd like to get some speakers and lectures going. Um, kind of relate to that dinner and a talk feature there, the third point. Uh, maybe touring some local facilities, getting involved in science fairs. I know that's a popular thing with local AMS and NWA chapters across the country. Uh, maybe do some career nights for people that are interested in careers in meteorology. Um, offering support materials to K through 12 teachers and eventually uh, hosting a regional workshop, local or regional workshop down the road uh, for meteorologists and, uh, and those who are interested in uh, the chapter. So those are just some of the goals we have in mind and um, welcome guys. And I think with that we are going to move on to a recap of the blizzard of last week. <clears throat> and here's Rob. This is um, a, a part of the meeting that uh, actually had started when I was in Toledo. Um, what we did, we had a, actually that was back in the days when we had weather service offices, and probably Bill Marino is the only one old enough to know what that means. Um, Toledo had a weather service office for a while with, uh, they didn't make forecasts there directly, it was more of a short term thing, and, and uh, um, the weather service started this just because back then, this is pre-internet days, remember that. Back then, if you were a weather buff, you had to spend a lot of money on CompuServe and dial in with your 16 baud modem, not 16K, 16 baud, uh, to get maps. So they would actually come in and present some real weather maps for us to look at, and, and we loved it as being in the public. And, and um, the weather service office closed. They were merged uh, into Cleveland and to North Webster, and part of it went up to Detroit. And so I, I took this over, and actually from doing this, this is where my very first job ca offer came from. The chief meteorologist at uh, Stan Stachek in Toledo, they needed help one day and they remembered seeing me do this and knowing I didn't suck and asked me to come and fill in and help. So uh, I say that all because this is kind of a segment that we want you to get involved in. If this is something you're interested in, if you have a basic understanding of the weather, if you want one of us to help you through it, but we'd like to have you, someone, uh, anyone basically, volunteer to come up and do these presentations. Normally what, what we would do is just give a quick five minute overview of the forecast and, and what's going on, but I think the forecast is boring enough that it's a little bit better this time to just go over the blizzard. It's not gonna be too in depth, but just showing you a good variety of maps and how the process went. Um, we all obviously know how it finished, but how the whole forecast uh, and uh, the forecast itself went through. And I'm starting with, uh, this is a forecast map from Sunday. So this was a long range forecast. We knew the storm was coming. Uh, this is not one of those storms that we had a lot of questions about whether it was gonna form. Once we got into the four, three, two day time frame, we knew something was going to happen at that point, just the severity and the exact details on where it's going were the question. Uh, the initial forecast was a little bit high. This is the 15 to 18 inch range, um, which didn't quite pan out that high, but nonetheless, the, the, the areas of concern were certainly ended up being, being the accurate areas, and this is three days in advance. Again, this was issued Sunday afternoon. Um, and this was the, uh, the Monday afternoon forecast where they did tone down some and maybe a little bit too much in the Grand Rapids area, obviously. But most of that worked out. The extreme southeast corner of the state didn't quite get as much because of a wintry mix. And then Indiana kind of, again, that wintry mix messed things up. But nonetheless, this was not a surprise. Uh, I was out around midnight that night to drive into work, to drive into the hospital, and there was nobody on the roads, which no one ever listens to our forecast. So to actually have people pay attention to our forecast, even though the next day they probably said we hyped it up too much, uh, they were paying attention to it. And that's really our goal, whether or not people hate us afterwards is just 
that's secondary. Quick run through of this, the weather maps. Uh, and again, normally if we're doing a presentation, I would I would have made it a little prettier, but this is kind of after the fact. Uh, this is at 12Z, this is at 7 a.m. Monday. We've got the low pressure system all the way down in eastern Texas. And, and I'm gonna compare this to the blizzard of 78 later, but just to draw your attention, big area high pressure up over the, uh, the northern plain states. Um, so very strong high pressure and uh, good, but not excessive low pressure. Certainly this does not compare at all to the blizzard of 78. In that morning we had temperatures in the mid-teens, just a couple of hit and miss light snow showers. Notice a little wintry mix down through the Ohio River Valley, but obviously all eyes are on that storm system coming up out of Texas. This is 12 hours later, 7 p.m. Uh, the, the, the high was 1052, it's 1048 now, so it's not quite as strong, but still a notable high pressure system. That's sliding on off to the southeast. Got the low pressure area right now over uh, extreme southwest Indiana. Got some good strong winds wrapping around it. We're warming up into the 20s and some 30s, still getting some light snow. This is Chicago, we got three stars, so the snow's getting moderate and they've got winds at uh, sustained winds at 30 miles per hour already. So a breezy day out ahead of the system. Uh, again, watching the, the extremely cold air, this is a temperature of zero in uh, northwest uh, Oklahoma. The Texas Panhandle is at 11. So, so not typical weather for them by any stretch, a good surge of Arctic air. And then this is 7 a.m. Tuesday morning as the storm starting to wind down. You see we're out in the, the, the low pressure is, is not quite as tight as it was before. The high is not quite as tight. The difference, in the, uh, and I do have some 70 maps later on, but but the reason, one of the helps for our good winds in this storm is not necessarily how strong these two particular, again, the storm itself is not a big strong storm, but it's close to this strong high enough that the gradient winds, the lines are very close together. And as the winds come down, that really accelerated. Notice at 7 a.m. Uh, Tuesday, as we're dying off, uh, Chicago still getting moderate snow and still getting 20 to 30 mile per hour winds sustained. And if you saw any of the pictures from Chicago, you know they had gusts much higher than that. But now at this point, uh, we've got Dallas, Texas at 12 degrees. Um, so this Arctic air just making a beeline straight on down, really helping to fuel some of this storm system. I'm not going to spend too much time on these maps because I know we've got a wide variety of, of weather knowledge in here. But we're starting with the jet stream map. Uh, this is at um, uh, 7 a.m. Tuesday. So really, as the storm is just winding down. But this good strong area of winds in excess of 150 to 175 miles per hour. So uh, just a very strong jet, but you notice the way it curves all the way back around. This is uh, just a, a good sign of some, some very cold air that's, uh, that's making its way down through the states. This is at 500 millibars. This is about 18,000 feet up. This is what we look at really to get a good idea of, of, of storm tracks. Uh, we got a 500 millibar low. It's centered pretty much over us. Um, a little trough coming out of the southwest that brought us some more snow later. But again, just noticing all the triangles, there's a lot of strong winds in this system out up front ahead of it even. Come around just a little bit, 700 millibars now. This is where we look for the moisture. We've got some good strong winds wrapping all around this storm. Um, it, uh, again, the, the, there was not a lot of bad weather. A lot of times when we get a good blizzard, there's severe weather down south. Things didn't work out very well for the, the, the southeast to get a whole lot of uh, tornadoes. There were a couple of watches, I think a couple of minor spin-ups. But uh, one of the big concerns in winter storms is the southeast, and they, they missed out on this particular event. Uh, so it didn't get a whole lot. And then an 850 millibars, again, just right off the deck. We've got that 850 low centered in a perfect spot for, for getting some good snows into, into, into the Michigan area. Very strong winds coming all the way around it uh, with uh, 30 to uh, 50 mile per hour winds and higher sustained at 850. So uh, again, this, the questions are not, were, uh, were not will we get a storm, but, but where the exact path of the storm will end up. And other than getting some of that dry air, some of that mixed precip down in Jackson towards Detroit, uh, the, the forecast really panned out. This was a discussion uh, from SPC, uh, the, the National Storm Prediction Center. They put out a little winter weather update around, uh, I think it was around four or five in the morning, but as the bulk of the blizzard conditions moved on off, the storm itself was up here, but because of the lake effect, Chicago was still getting uh, intense uh, thunderstorm, thunder snow uh, as it moved on through the area. Just a couple of radar maps. Um, this starts at seven o'clock where where we're looking at the intensity scale on the left-hand side there. You want the 30s to get into the real intense snow, and we didn't have any of that. It started off as a, as a moderate snow. I mean, it, it, it wasn't flurries at this time, but it, but it wasn't uh, really, really bad. And as we go, this is at uh, 10 o'clock. 
Uh, we notice some, some darker, these pinks and purples coming in, the heavier snow coming in. You also know a little dry uh, slot south of Jackson. Uh, you can kind of see some wavy patterns if you look really close, it's just uh, as the storm system is, is really gaining strength and, and there's a little bit of banding developing in this snow. This is it. Um, at 11 o'clock, we got the big dry air from Jackson on southeast to help to mix them up and dry them up. And notice we got some hefty snows coming over Kalamazoo. That banding is a little more evident where you see some darks, even some purples, followed by light. So that's why the snow wasn't continuous for most places. It would get really, really heavy, and then it would lay off. It, it never quite ended unless you're in that dry air. This is at uh, 1 a.m. when we really crank things up. Uh, there was supposed to be some lightning data, but an interesting study that um, um, uh, was pointed out that, that a lot of the uh, lightning was likely or possibly, depending on how you want to word it, related to TV towers because uh, snow levels are so low, electrical levels are so low that it just takes a little bit of something to spark it off. And we noticed a lot of lightning at a lot of transmitter towers. It also happened in uh, southeast Eaton County. It was near some of the towers that we use for public safety. Uh, I didn't know it at the time, so I didn't save it in this lightning data, and, and lightning data is nearly impossible for non-government people to get after the fact. But uh, just nonetheless, when you get in this, you notice it's not a continuous pink or purple. It's, it's, it's more of a convective. It's more of a showery type look, and that's why, again, we went through Jackson, had gone through nothing, and now it's getting this intense burst of snow that dropped a couple of inches in, in less than two hours. Pulled up briefly, this is the base velocity. This is the winds. The greens are the inbounds and the reds are the outbounds. We've got some very strong winds coming from the northeast headed to the southwest. Uh, from, uh, and then I, the, I can go into too detailed explanation, but the wind changed the direction with height just a bit. But I'll, you'll see this because you won't see these bright colors later on as the storm began to wind down. So again, this is 1 a.m. This is a map of the surface conditions. The low was southeast of uh, Indianapolis moving on off to the northeast. You see these uh, satellite maps showing the, the heavier, the enhanced tops uh, long and north of Grand Rapids and then continuing up into Wisconsin and wrapping around the backside. And this is at 4 a.m. We're starting to see the, the bulk of the snow end. If you remember, there was a little bit of snow that came in later on. This is that edge, this back edge wrapping back around. But at 4 a.m., for the most part, the storm system had wound down everywhere south and east of Grand Rapids. And then uh, finally, 7 a.m., we see that back edge starting to come back through, which dropped maybe another inch or so as, as, as it progressed from west to east across the area. And here's that comparison map of the wind speeds at 7 a.m. It's not quite as strong. Still a noticeable lot of the northeast uh, moving to the southwest. You can even see some ripples uh, right here. And then you see the little wave as it pushed around the backside. So um, I, I only show velocity because a lot of times people think we can only look at velocity in summertime and storms, but we actually use the velocity data in the winter as well to pick up some features. Uh, this is at 10 or 9 a.m. as the low has now moved off to Erie, Pennsylvania. We're wrapping around the back side. We still had those strong winds coming out of the north northeast because these, these isobars are so, so closely held together. What kind of snow totals? We've got a couple different versions. Snow is the hardest thing to measure, so it's impossible to measure when you have 30 mile per hour winds blowing all the time. But these are some fairly accurate totals, uh, uh, anywhere from a foot or more from the thumb all the way down through Grand Rapids, and then the two foot, the colors here in red from uh, south of Milwaukee to Chicago. Also had some observation reports, and these are kind of hard to see, but nonetheless, 12 to 13 inches around. Uh, Lansing, uh, 13 to 17 inches around Grand Rapids, Kalamazoo, a little bit under 10, to 8 to 10, and then around 7 to 8 in, uh, in the Detroit area. A quick look, this is just a radar estimated snow total. Everything in yellow or light or higher is uh, 10 inches or more, so obviously if you're out on a boat, you got the most amount of snow, but um, I don't know who verified that one. A lot of talk about all the records. There are so many ways you can keep records that it doesn't really matter what you say. You could probably call it a record anything and it counts, but this did not rank on the, the calendar day records uh, for anyone just because of the way the snow fell starting before midnight and ending in the morning. Um, but nonetheless, uh, and I put this on a map that, that, that runs all the way down south, you see parts of Missouri got two feet as well. So this was a major storm across all of the area. Notice everyone has 78 in there somewhere. So I'll do a quick look at blizzard of 78. Um, this is the map of the day before the storm. We've got a big low, pr that high is now way up in Canada. So not quite the same influence. We've got a low pressure system up 
in with Minnesota, another low pressure coming up out of the south, they combine the next day. So that's really what intensified and made the blizzard more, much more of a factor than it was in 78 than it was this year. Plus, Grand Rapids was on the back side. I was in Toledo on the front side of that where the winds were much, much stronger as it moved on through. Uh, but obviously, you can see just the size of this system and the strength of it were notably different. The low pressure records were just obliterated by the blizzard of 78, which did not happen for us. These are a couple pictures. This is Grand Rapids. These, the rest are Toledo, uh, where I'm from. This is one of our main roads in Toledo going into downtown, which looks a lot like Lake Shore Drive did in Chicago. This is people going through downtown Toledo, which is not a common occurrence. And then this, didn't know what it was at first. It's a ranch house. They've cut out their uh, uh, garage. This is in Bowling Green. This is uh, south of Toledo, about 20 miles. So I don't know how they got out of their garage and cut it out. This is before the days of Photoshop, so I know it's true. Um, but he was actually able to walk up onto his roof. I'm sure it had something to do with the way they were oriented, and uh, Toledo had 60 to 70 mile per hour winds. So, so that's uh, just a quick, uh, the software I used was GR2 Analyst, uh, which is uh, available to anyone, and then the Weather Service, thanks Nathan for uh, grabbing me some pictures. Any questions about that, or the storm itself? I know I went through fast, and again, normally if this is something you're interested in, we can help you get some of that data if you wanna make a presentation. Uh, if it's a forecast or if it's a, if it's a recap, certainly of interest to all. Thank you. At uh, this time, I'd like to invite Moss Ford from the Sustainability Council here at GRCC for a few comments. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Well, that was. Uh, fascinating. I mean, I, I've never attended a live uh, weather <laughs> recap, uh, and that was that was wonderful. Uh, my name is Mossinger. I'm the director of sustainability for Grand Rapids Community College, and we are very happy uh, with the Sustainability Council sponsoring this evening's event. And uh, we're very excited about the development of your chapter. Um, the Sustainability Council and our sustainability efforts at Grand Rapids Community College are, are really twofold. One is of course, education. We want to do everything we can to educate our students and community about really three things, economics and the, um, the triple bottom line of economics, environment, and social equity. And that we uh, have just some really fantastic programs, whether it is you wanna get into workforce training uh, with wind, uh, solar, uh, battery technology, um, we have, uh, English classes that uh, focus on um, sustainability and, and uh, sustainable literature. Um, and we have just some fantastic programs. We have uh, speakers uh, regularly coming in and, and talking about the environment, talking about uh, the economic situations that, you know, this, these all, thing, the, all these things are tied together. So um, we hope that this will be a great uh, start for your chapter and uh, a relationship. Anytime you want to come back, we'd love to host you. So. Thank you. All right, then we'll get started there. Okay, I think we're ready, Nathan, for the presentation. You have your mic. Okay. Okay, as you heard earlier, uh, my name is Nathan Jerusal, a meteorologist at the Weather Service. One of the things that the Weather Service is trying to do nowadays is we are trying to go toward a decision, a decision support um, type of service in addition to our normal services. And our normal services, uh, for those of you that may not know, are really you know, to protect lives and property. And we do that through you know, like warnings, watches, advisories, those types of things. So you know, that's, that's been our bread and butter you know, for the longest time. And we're trying to do that also now, but through more uh, decision services. And that's, that's kind of how we got involved with the Kalamazoo River oil spill back in July. How many people remember hearing about this back you know, in July when this occurred down in Kalamazoo and Marshall area? So you know, pretty much everybody heard about it. It was in the news quite a bit. It was you know, a pretty big deal. Um, you know, especially to have in our backyard. Most of the time, you know, you think of like a big oil spill, you think of deep, deep water horizon to start with. And then you also think of like Exxon Valdez, 
you know, all those, it, it seems to be, you know, the tankers or the pipelines that have issues. So you don't really think, you know, that there's really much here in Michigan that that could happen. But, and I think all of us at the office also kind of never really thought this would happen until it actually did. Um, so that's what I'm going to talk about tonight. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about, you know, just the background knowledge, kind of refresh everybody about what had happened. And then I'm going to go in and talk about what the Weather Service did to support the cleanup of the oil spill and everything like that. So you can see the picture there. Um, this is about a week after the oil spill had occurred. This is the pipeline right here. Um, essentially, they had dug it out. And you'll see a couple pictures here a little bit later. But essentially, you can see all the sludge and saturated soil, everything. And you can see how they were starting to attack that. They were starting to dig it out and everything. So, you know, this is just a week after. Um, and I mean, they worked on it and they're still working on it. And they're probably going to continue working on it for the next year or two, I would assume. You know, the big part of it is done. The big part of it is cleaned up. But there's still little nooks and crannies out there. There's still vegetation out there that's really difficult to get to. And so they're going to be working on that for a while. So here's some of the headlines that were in the local papers. I think most of them were actually from the Kalamazoo Gazette being that that's probably the biggest paper around that area. But, you know, in the picture behind it, this is actually a picture from the oil spill. You can see that, uh, I think this looks, you know, it looks more like probably Talmadge Creek there. But then you can see how all the soil and vegetation around it is blackened. And what had happened, I'll go into a little bit more detail in just a little bit, but it just so happened that right before the oil spill occurred, we had had quite a bit of rainfall down there across that area. And we were actually, um, elevated river levels, even close to flooding levels on, in that area. So to start with, the river levels were high. You know, they were pretty much you know, in the vegetation here in the floodplain. And then the oil came down the stream and the river and just kind of saturated all this. So it really was even worse you know, than what it would have been you know, had just the river been about you know, average flow at that point or average level. But you can see some of the headlines. Um, you know, more than 800,000 gallons of oil spill into the Kalamazoo River. Governor Jennifer Granholm says Kalamazoo River oil spill cleanup vastly improved. Um, you know, it was even on the president's plate. You know, Obama was being briefed in about this. So it was definitely a big deal as far as the country it was concerned. So this is a picture of the actual part of the pipe that was leaking the oil. The pipeline was about 30 inches in diameter you know, and that's a, that's a pretty darn big tear there. So, you know, obviously it took quite something to spill 800,000 gallons of oil. You know, obviously did it over a period of time. It didn't happen in just, you know, a couple hours. But, you know, definitely, definitely caused some big issues there. So we had 800, over 800,000 gallons. Some, some people even say it was up to a million gallons. Um, that happened near Marshall, Michigan. Uh, it was really like Sunday night into Monday on 725, 726. And the way that it was explained in the news that, you know, some workers actually kind of smell or the public actually smelled a little bit of oil, what smelled like an oil spill. And, you know, people went, checked it out, couldn't find anything because it was in the middle of the night. So then the next morning, eventually they found it, they reported it. And then from then on, you know, they started reacting to it and trying to clean it up, stop it at first and everything. But the oil, it, it was in Talmadge Creek, and that leads into the Kalamazoo River, just a couple miles downstream there. So it didn't take a whole lot for it to get to the Kalamazoo River, right near Marshall. The oil nearly made it to Morrow Lake, and I'll show you a map here in just a minute. But that was kind of an important thing as far as uh, the response was concerned, because they felt like if, they, if the oil made it to Morrow Lake, that there wasn't going to be a whole lot to stop it from maybe getting to Lake Michigan. So it was definitely a big concern. They felt like that was their best opportunity to stop it right at the dam there. The spill actually made international news. Uh, you know, it was reported internationally. So, but you know, I know NBC News was there. Not, the national reporters were there one night actually reporting from the oil spill. Um, but then eventually, you know, as it kind of got stopped and you know, the cleanup was occurring, you know, it kind of was overshadowed by Deepwater Horizon because that was continuing on well past when this happened. So, you know, it kind of got lost in the news. You had a couple days of it in the national news. You know, it continued in the local news here for a while because obviously it was still going on. 
but you know it it, it kind of get was stopped there, and then so it wasn't as bad as like deep water where it kept going and going for months. This is a map of the area that the oil spill affected. Here's Marshall on the right side, and this right here, that, that green star, was the origin of the oil spill there. And that was on the pipeline. I'll show the pipeline in just a minute. But this is in Calhoun County, and this is the Kalamazoo River going right here, and this is Talmadge Creek. So you can see where the oil spill occurred, and then it didn't take very far to get into the main river there. Well, this whole area here that's hatched is essentially the river area that was affected, and it goes all the way to Morrow Lake, and that's where that is there. That's actually in Cal Kalamazoo County. It affected some areas. It went right through downtown Battle Creek. It went through the Fort Custer State Park area. You know, so it definitely affected some bigger areas there. But some of these orange triangles that you see all along the river, those are many places where they had deployed boom to try and stop the oil from moving any farther downstream to catch it. And then they also used actually some absorbent boom, which actually kind of just soaked it up like a sponge. And they used other things also in different places, depending on you know, how the river was in different places. Uh, they used different ways to catch that oil. So. This is the pipeline. Uh, this is courtesy of the Kalamazoo Gazette. But the pipeline, you can see a few different pipelines. And uh, Enbridge is actually, I believe, a company that's based out of Canada. So, and this is, uh, this is oil that really is shipped to us from Canada. They have a facility down uh, in Griffith, Indiana there. So you can see some of these pipelines that come in. And this is the pipeline here. Uh, it actually comes in from up top here, Sarnia, Ontario goes through Howell, the Marshall area, and then down to the Griffith, Indiana uh, plant that they have. So, but this is line 6B, not important, but that's right where the leak site was, right near Marshall. So, some of the effects of the oil spill, um, this is a picture of a turtle, an uh, oil-covered turtle. That was probably one of the things that uh, I heard about while I was down there. I should mention that I was actually down there working at the incident command post for about 11 days. We had other, many other meteorologists. Uh, T.J. Turnage, he's in the crowd here tonight. He was one of the first people, along with our warning coordination meteorologist, Jamie Belinsky. Those two really did the, the, did the initial response as far as our office was concerned. Then as we realized it was going to go into a longer period, then we started getting more and more people involved. But I'll go into that in a, in a little bit. Some of the effects of the oil spill, we had many different things that uh, you know, were going on as a result. One of the first things, and probably one of the most concerning things to the public, was the, levels of, the elevated levels of benzene in the air from the oil that had spilled. Um, initially, it wasn't so bad, but what happened then was that because of it getting into the vegetation, and then because of the fact that the river went down, um, it got warm out, and some of that benzene in the product actually was released. And so it, I think from what I remember, there was a couple days before, but then it started you know, becoming airborne, and people around the river were starting to feel sick. They were starting to you know, have issues. And so that became more of an issue as time went on. So you know, obviously, that was a big public issue. River access, you know, all along the river from Marshall all the way down to Marl Lake was, you know, pretty much restricted or closed, and that was including all the parks along and near the river. High, I mentioned earlier that the high river levels uh, from the rains just before the spill, that saturated the vegetation high up on the riverbank, so that essentially caused just much more of a cleanup issue, you know, for the company. Many homeowners' properties were affected. Um, some of those homeowners were trying to sell their houses, and eventually uh, some of them actually sold to Enbridge as the company that you know, had the pipeline there. So that, you know, they were affected seriously, and people were evacuated, kind of going with the first thing there. And then, as I had mentioned about the turtle, uh, many animals were saturated with oil and many perished. Turtles and birds were probably two of the most affected animals in the river there but there was many different ones like muskrats, you know, just all those types of different things. And so, you know, go on to the next frame here, the Fish and Wildlife Service and the DNR were two big players in this. They were two of the bigger agencies that were involved with this. But you can see it was a multi-agency effort. Enbridge was the company. Um, they took full responsibility. I'll tell you, you know, being there, 
they were doing everything they could to you know, try and fix the problem, and they continue to do so today. Then what happened was because you know, it was a public safety issue and you know, essentially the government came in to kind of coordinate the response, the Environmental Protection Agency was the company, or not the company, but the agency that was overseeing everything. So the EPA was overseeing everything and Enbridge was kind of you know, the responsible party. Those two, comp or those two entities were working together along with all the other ones. So you had the DNR, you had us that were a part of it, you had the Calhoun County Emergency Management, you had Kalamazoo Emergency Management, you had the state police, and then you also had the Coast Guard, and the Coast Guard was involved because of the fact that they were concerned that it was gonna be getting to Lake Michigan. That was something they did not want to happen. That would have been even worse. I mean, this was bad enough to start with, but had it got to Lake Michigan, that would have been really bad. How many people have ever heard of the incident command system? It would be ICS. What that is, is it's actually kind of a uniform or organized way of I don't know, reacting to an event or handling an event. Um, this is involved with, uh, emergency managers use this all the time, and it, it's, it's used from anything from a simple you know, house fire, you know, where it's a very simple response, you know, it's you know, a couple fire departments and police, or it could go up to something very big like this was. And what it is, it's, um, it's the incident command structure, and this is a template that's used in many things. You don't necessarily always use each section here. Um, like you have what you call the incident commanders. In a, in a house fire, the incident commander is you know, the highest ranking official, or it would actually be the first person on scene, and then eventually it goes to the highest ranking official that would be on the scene, or maybe even coordinating from the emergency operations center. But in this case, uh, what, what happened is you had many different incident commanders or a unified command. And I won't go too in depth into this, but I just kind of want to show you know, that it's a very organized response. It wasn't just kind of like a free for all, everybody trying to do what they wanted to do. You know, essentially this became, you know, this became the template and that's the, organiza the organized effort to you know, clean, up the clean up the oil spill, to protect the lives and property out there from the, you know, ramifications of it. And so this is, this is what that is. Um, we, the National Weather Service, was a part of the planning section. And the reason that we are a part of the planning section was because obviously the weather has a lot to do with you know, their activities. Um, and I'll go into it in just a minute. But you know, every day for the first couple weeks, you know, there, was a, there was a group of people in the planning section that essentially was trying to figure out everything to how many, how many resources were needed, to how many people were needed, um, you know, what needed to be done. I mean, that's, that's their job, is to plan things out. Then you have like an operations, which is basically the boots on the ground. You know, they're the ones out there trying to clean everything up. You have people in the finance division that have to you know, essentially deal with the financing of the spill. And then you also have like, a, um, go back to the last one, and then you have a logistics, trying to take care of you know, getting resources in, getting them out, those types of things. So, but we were in the planning section, trying to give you know, everybody that was you know, trying to figure out you know, what to do next, those types of things, to give them weather input you know, so they could plan accordingly. So you can see down here, uh, this particular day, I just kind of scanned this in, but myself, I was there that particular day, and then um, one of the forecasters from the Gaylord office. So. And I'll kind of talk about the timeline, how we staff that. So the initial, what, what happened initially is that the initial effort uh, was coordinated from the Calhoun County Emergency Operations Center. And you know, so that's what typically happens. You know, if there's an emergency or some kind of event in, the, in a county, it kind of goes to the county EOC, as we call it. It started out that way, but as you know, Everybody was kind of understanding how big this was and how, much, how many resources were going to be needed. They found out very quickly that it wasn't going to work. And so what they had to do, and this is what uh, the EPA, the on-scene coordinator and eventually incident commander, talked with the governor and said, we need more resources, we need a bigger EOC or an a incident command post, as this is called. So what they did, the governor helped them out, 
and they actually uh, got a school. And this was August, the beginning of August, late July. So this is the first thing they could come up with. They need something real quick to be able to house all these different people in the incident command structure. So this is an aerial view. Uh, it's elementary school in Marshall, you know, just, just a little bit out of the city there, Walter Elementary School. And so essentially, they were there, or everybody was there, and everybody behind the scenes was kind of stationed there. And that was including us, the Weather Service. Then obviously we have a problem come around the beginning of September, and that is school starts. So what they had to do, they were starting to you know, think of this probably soon after they moved in here, you know, the first part of August, that they knew they couldn't be there much longer than probably late August. So they started looking for another place, and they eventually ended up going to this place here, and that's what they called the Pratt Command Post. And it turns out that this place is actually an old warehouse, I, I believe, for the Campbell Soup Company. So, and they moved there late August, and then they're actually still there. So this is the first place. This is the elementary school. This is the ICP, as we call it, the Incident Command Post. And again, there's the aerial shot, but you know, it's not really important, but you can see how different people are you know, scattered around the area. Like the planning section, this was in a classroom. We had, you know, it was elementary school, so it was, you know, we had these small tables there. We were sitting in small chairs. Not exceptionally comfortable, but you know what? We didn't really pay attention a lot because it was busy. So, you know, it worked. We had a place that we could work there and everything, and, you know, it worked out for what we needed. This was a library. It actually held a few different uh, divisions or branches, sections. You had finance, you had logistics, you had public health. Public health was a big thing there, obviously. You had the Coast Guard in the little room on the side of the library. And then here, this was like the main office of the elementary school. You had the incident commander pretty much in the principal's office. You had the deputy incident commander, and then you had the JIC, which is the Joint Information Center. And that was essentially where all the information that was shared out to the public, that is where you know, the room was, you know, that everybody was coordinating that. So, and then you had like kind of a cafeteria gym here with a stage, and we did some briefings there each day. Then when we went late August, I had a chance to actually go to both places, so it was kind of neat to see the differences between those two places. But this is the aerial shot there, and this is the warehouse here. And then what they did was the warehouse was kind of really um, given to, or I, I shouldn't say given, it, Enbridge actually, Enbridge is paying for all of this. But Enbridge was kind of stationed in the warehouse. They had all these different stations. They had you know, a place you know, for all their workers that were out in the field to come eat. They stored supplies there, all that kind of stuff. So it was a place, you know, that they could do a lot of things. Then they had the trailers, and that was actually for the, I don't know, the government side of things, where, you know, you had the EPA. We were actually in this trailer right here, event, and then eventually got moved to this one, as they kind of, kind of, you know, everybody was starting to tone down a little bit or scale down a little bit. But, um, so essentially, you had all the government entities here, and then you had the private, you know, Enbridge there. And this kind of just shows you, you know, how they were set up. Um, you know, but you had, and you had actually restrooms. They actually had a restroom trailer. It was kind of interesting, you know. Thankfully, it was warm out at that point. I don't know how it is right now. Uh, they have a little bit of heat, but it could be, it could be a little cold, so. But, you know. Very interesting to say the least. Um, and this, is, this was actually before we moved in, but they were you know, starting to do all that. They actually had decking in between, you know, kind of as a safety thing because you know, uneven ground, they don't want any trips or falls. You know, they actually have a safety officer looking at all the possibilities you know, of what could happen, whether it be heat or trips and falls, or you know, when the frost came around, they were salting the deck every day. So a lot of things to consider there. So now I'm going to kind of go into, you know, really the meat and potatoes of this presentation here on, you know, what we did, the timeline, all those types of things. So this decision support that we provided, you know, at the Marshall oil spill, the main thing there was the weather support for the safety of all personnel. You know, we wanted to make sure that there was no heat stroke. We wanted to help out so that, you know, if there was lightning or severe weather around there, you know, that people were aware of that. You know, so those were some of the things, you know, that we were helping out with. 
The other thing that was very important, we were providing weather input for evacu possible evacuations and for air quality. That was a big thing, you know, for the first few weeks. So those two things were probably the biggest thing. Another big thing, too, was weather and hydrology input for cleanup activities and decision planning on and along the river. You know, obviously, a lot of the things, you know, the spill was in the river, and, you know, they, you know, they had it high to start with, so they had to determine, you know, if it was going to be going down what, and how they would plan out their activities in the cleanup. So we were a part of that also. And I should also add, and I have it in many different places, that the River Forecast Center in Minneapolis that services the Grand River, all the rivers in Michigan was an integral part of this also. We also did weather support for overflight operations. Um, after a week or two, they started doing, you know, helicopter uh, flights every day to kind of monitor the progress of things and see, you know, what they need to, you know, concentrate on everything. Then we are also a resource for all the miscellaneous weather requests. And these were just, you know, like one-time requests. Um, one of the things that I got a request from was the National Transportation Safety Board. They wanted to know what the river levels were, you know, at the time of the oil spill. And then they were also then looking to model that. So, you know, they needed a contact. They needed, it's almost like networking. They needed to have somebody that could help them get the information that they needed. And there was lots of other requests too, you know, before they started doing routine aviation flights, you know, they would come in and say, okay, we want to fly today. What's the weather going to be like? Is there going to be thunderstorms around? You know, those types of things. So, you know, it was all different things like that, that we were just, you know, we were a face for the weather, you know, for the weather service and to try and help out wherever we could. So as far as the resources were concerned, um, obviously the National Weather Service in Grand Rapids, our office here, was, you know, the main player. But we had a lot of help from a lot of different places in the weather service also. National Weather Service in Detroit, the North Central River Forecast Center, and Central Region Headquarters were all the main resources. So those four entities were probably the core of the response and the resources. Then, eventually, and I'll kind of talk about this in the timeline that I have in a couple frames, meteorologists from many other offices, including Gaylord, Northern Indiana, Chicago, Marquette, Milwaukee, and then others in different states like Kentucky, Wyoming, Colorado, Missouri, Kansas all helped on with, or they all helped with on-site support. They actually came here for five to eight days apiece and, you know, worked there. So it was, it was def we, we definitely had a lot of help. It was, it was a team effort. It was no one office, no one person, those types of things. And one thing that uh, everybody that went to the incident command post, everybody that had, or it was one thing in common, and that is that everybody that went there had the incident command structure courses. And that is a lot of the stuff that the emergency management takes so that we know what the structure is. We know who to report to when we go to one of these events. Or, you know, we know what the, what the protocol is, those types of things. So most of us that, that had gone there had taken all the required classes to go to an event like this at an incident command post. So here's the timeline that how things kind of happen. NWS, Grand Rapids, the initial immediate support started at the state EOC on the 27th of July. Then what happened is eventually, or we, we briefed there through July 29th. At that point, it was realized that we were needed on site or very close. The incident command post was within a mile, I think, of where the oil spill actually occurred but we were not there. I did not actually see firsthand the oil, you know, the, the pipeline or anything like that, but we were very close. And usually that's pretty typical in an event like this. They don't, they don't want you at ground zero. They want you just off site a little bit so you're not affected by whatever's going on and everything. So we started at the incident command post, TJ and then Jamie started there uh, the first couple days, July 30th and 31st. And then my first day was August 1st. And I think at that point, you know, I remember the day that uh, TJ came up to me and asked, you know, if I was going to be available to go down there. I, I think that none of us had a, you know, idea that we we're going to be going down there through November, really. You know, I mean, we knew that it was a big deal, but we didn't know that, you know, we were going to have to have 21 different meteorologists go down there at some point. So it was kind of a, you know, discovery thing. You know, it was a new thing for all of us, and, you know, we didn't know what to expect. But... 
Then what happened was starting on August 2nd, I, the day before, we started coordinating, getting other people in from other offices because we realized that you know they were going to be long days. I mean, Jamie, TJ, and I each worked uh, 16 to 18 hour days, you know, multiple days for the first few days. So it was it was quite long days there, and that's including travel time. But you know, that's a lot, and you know, thinking that this may go on for even a couple of weeks, it's like you know we can't keep doing that. So. In coordination with Central Region, they're like, okay, you need some extra resources. So at that point, we actually had a meteorologist, uh, the warning coordination meteorologist from the Northern Indiana office come up for two or three days. And what they did is they started with the morning shift and then the, the people from Grand Rapids would do the afternoon shift. The forecast office in Detroit supported the state EOC in Lansing from July 30th to August 12th. At that point, they kind of spun down. They weren't really needed at the state EOC. So they kind of, that, that kind of stopped around August 12th. The forecast office in Detroit also supported from their office with some high split data. And that was um, essentially what that is, it's, it's kind of the models kind of showing, you know, if something was, you know, released, like benzene, you know, from the oil there, how it would be blown around by the winds, you know, and how it would, depending on, you know, like the density of it and all those types of things, where it would travel. And that was you know, for support of evacuation possibilities. Then on September 5th, the staffing at the incident, incident command post went down to one shift per day. And that was because uh, we were doing anywhere from three to five briefings from seven o'clock in the morning until six o'clock at night. And at that point, they started scaling back just a little bit. I mean, they were still full force cleaning up and everything. But you know, there wasn't quite as many briefings, and we determined, everybody, uh, the meteorologist in charge, Dan Cobb, along with Central Region, determined that one shift per day should cover that. So that continued through November 8th. Um, I, I just happened to be there on that day. That was the last day that we had personnel on the ground at the incident command post. And that was a big transition in the organization that occurred. Um, at that time, what we did is we started doing remote briefings and remote support. So that started, and to be honest, it still continues to this day. I just did the briefing at 5 o'clock this afternoon, and it looks like, I, I think at the very least, we're probably going to continue through the springtime when the ice will melt on the rivers. And they are still doing work out there. So the only time that we've not had to do that were five days around Thanksgiving and 11 days around Christmas and New Year's. So... Essentially, it's been quite a long time. I mean, pretty good. So right now, uh, wh where we're at is we produce slides every day. They have to be produced by 3.30, 3.45 each day. We have to email them to the people there. And then Monday through Friday, we actually brief them via phone. And you know, give them, it's usually a five, 10 minute briefing at most. So as far as the routine duties are concerned, um, it started out that, you know, and this is when we were down at the incident command post, we were producing two slide decks a day. Um, the brief, it was, they were brief slides were, or I'm sorry. So we produced two different briefings per day, but we actually briefed four to five times. We used the briefings multiple times. We produced a spot forecast, spot forecast package twice a day. I actually have a couple examples of those. We coordinated any new routine requests that were you know, brought in from some of the personnel there. And then, as I mentioned earlier, we fulfilled non-routine requests. So the NTSB, because they were kind of in charge of the investigation, being that it's kind of a transportation thing via oil, but it still is, and they were in charge of that. Aviation requests, air quality support, river modeling, and then any impromptu briefings for individuals. So I haven't been talking about the pictures too much, but you can kind of see this is one of the booms out there. And this is all oil sheen. You can kind of tell it has that little rain. It's, it's kind of tough to tell out there probably, but there's like this little rainbow tinge to it and that, that would be the oil kind of spread out there. You can see it's not as much here, but then you can see it along the shoreline also where that vegetation is kind of still, you know, anytime water gets on there, it rains or if the water levels came up a little bit, then it would, you know, get back into the river. And so that's why they still have booms out there. This was an example of the briefings that we gave. Um, one of the things that really surprised me was they really wanted it simple. 
You know, I mean, I think as meteorologists, we, we like to be technical, we like to be scientific, um, but what they want is they just wanted a very simple forecast that they could understand and that they could go and plan their, you know, activities out as needed. So one of the things, you know, is just kind of a graphical forecast of what we expected over the next 12 hours, 12 to 24 hours, so this would be the first day, or this would be the tonight period. Then, excuse me, um, then we had the next day. So, you know, again, it's just kind of showing what the high temperature was. That particular day was 90. That was big problems for them. I'll kind of talk about that. Uh, river levels and what the forecast is, this can be found on our website. And then essentially it impacts the operations slide. And that really kind of highlighted, you know, what the big impacts were. In this case, you know, we were talking about tonight that through the evening hours that heat index values were going to decrease, but that, you know, we still have 86 to 91 degree heat indices, you know, at 6 p.m. Then for, you know, like an outlook period so that they could kind of get an idea, kind of plan things out. You know, we talked about no significant precipitation through Tuesday. Talked about the heat index, you know, is going to be a problem Monday through Tuesday. And then we also, you know, talked about the increasing chances for showers and thunderstorms. And that was twofold. Number one, they needed to know about rainfall that was going to occur, you know, because obviously that's going to wash, you know, oil back into the river and it's going to affect their boom operations and just operations in general. And then also the thunderstorms, obviously lightning is a hazard. So that was something they were very concerned about too. So I think that was actually something TJ introduced was the impact operation slide. And that was, that was probably one of the biggest things that they really liked because it really summarized well, you know, what their concerns or you know, what we thought, you know, would be the most impact to them, you know, as far as the weather was concerned. This was a spot forecast package that we put together. This is actually one that we use for fire weather, but we just use certain parameters, but that gave them a general idea of what the forecast was going to be. And different people use different things, you know, like they use this for input into one part of the operations. And then the briefing slides were used to brief really the incident commanders so that they can make the best decisions knowing what the weather was going to be and stuff. So we had the spot forecast there on the left. And then on the right here, this was produced by the River Forecast Center in Chanhassen, Minnesota, or Minneapolis. And, you know, so they kind of talked about different things here, but I think the biggest thing that the incident command staff was looking at was the forecast travel times if, you know, nothing was to stop things. So, you know, essentially if, or if uh, oil got in, you know, at Marshall, which it obviously did, the travel time would be about 32 hours to Battle Creek and then so on, and then finally from the Allegan Dam to New Richmond, which hopefully they were hoping it would never get that far, it would be about 30 hours you know, from those two points. So that was something they were kind of keeping in mind. That was something that the River Forecast Center updated twice a day. And that was based on the river models that they run there. A couple other things that were in the spot forecast package. This is essentially uh, the hydrologic statement, and you'll see that from our office on our website, and that just kind of gives what the flood stage is, what the observed stage is, what time it was, and then what the forecast is for the next three days. So obviously they wanted to know that. And not everybody wanted all the information, but you had, you know, some people wanted this, some people wanted that, and it was just lots of different things there. And so that's, you know, and when you put it all together, it was quite a few duties. And then finally, uh, this was added in after a little while, but this kind of gave, um, an idea of what the different scenarios could be. Like say if there was no rain whatsoever, you know, that the river level would probably just remain the same. But then if you put in like the max rainfall expected over the next few days, it would give you, you know, what the highest value could be. So it was kind of what they, they call an ensemble. So they ran it many different times with many different um, starting points and, hum and different uh, rainfall amounts so that they could get an idea of, you know, roughly the idea or roughly the, you know, response that they could expect from the different possibilities of the rainfall. And then this is, I mentioned the wind roses that the Detroit office was running for us for a little while. This is, you know, pretty much model output and it shows you what the winds are forecast to be up through the atmosphere. And this shows you what kind of direction you know, that way they could kind of focus in on, you know, where they would maybe need to look at doing evacuations and, you know, any other kind of ramifications that would occur because of the 
you know, benzene in the most, was the biggest problem. So this gave them an idea too. They were using that every day. So I kind of gave you an idea of all the duties. Um, now I'm just going to kind of show you some of the th other things that we did. One of the things that, uh, that we're in charge of while we're at the ICP, and we still do it at our office to this day, is issue alerts. You know, so they're kind of like little localized warnings. And we, would, we were handed, uh, we had a radio, this is at 800 megahertz for anybody that's interested, but uh, essentially we were, we were issued that. And then any time that one of these uh, meteorological phenomena occurred, we would actually go over the radio and like all the different um, foremen out there, you know, with the different groups, I mean, there was many different groups out there, different parts of the river. We would go on that radio and say, okay, you know, the first thing up there on the list is severe weather warnings. If a severe thunderstorm warning was issued, we would get on that radio and say, you know, a severe thunderstorm warning is in effect for the, you know, Division A. They had it divided up into uh, five different divisions. But we would actually go on that. So the foreman would get that information. They could get their people to safety, hopefully as quick as possible. And then, you know, so that's kind of how that worked. So severe weather warnings were one thing. One thing that I had to deal with quite a bit while I was down there was heat indices above 80 or 90. Uh, there was a couple different things we had to do for the different criteria. 80, we had to essentially send an email um, you know, to people letting them know. And you, know, you might say, well, why, a heat in why would a heat index of 80 be you know, an issue? Well, the problem was is that they had uh, PPE, personal protective equipment, so some of these people, you know, obviously they were dealing with oil. They were dealing with, you know, uh, poisonous, toxic, you know, chemicals. And so they were in these suits. Well, some of these suits were, uh, from what they said, you know, could be 15 to as much as 30 degrees warmer inside those suits. So you add 30 degrees on 80, you're looking at 110. And they really had to be careful of that because, you know, people could get heat stress real quickly that way. So that's why they wanted to know that. And then 90 was obviously even more important because you, know, you didn't really even need a lot of you know, PPE to have you know, overheat at that point. So what they would do is they would work for like 10, 15 minutes and they would be forced to take a break. They would have water, Gatorade, all that stuff out there to hydrate them. And then you know, they would have people observing too to make sure nobody was working too long and make sure everybody was following the safety protocol. Lightning, uh, that's pretty obvious, obviously. You know, they're out in the middle, you know, by some trees or out in the open. You know, that would be a danger. And the one big thing with that is they couldn't just necessarily get off the water and go take shelter. They had these suits on. They were in the water with the oil at times. They had to actually decon, decontaminate, before they could go to shelter. So sometimes that would take a half hour. So that's why we would have to give them as much notice as possible you know, especially within 60 minutes if possible, to give them that time so that they can decontaminate and then go take shelter for safety. They had boats on Morrow Lake and the river, so anytime winds were above about 25 miles per hour, they wanted to know about that. Dense fog, obviously you can't see there. You know, you don't want boats colliding or you don't want, you know, some of the things, you know, they were makeshift roads and they might not be able to tell where those roads are. So dense fog was an issue. Heavy rainfall in a short period of time, you know, that could be obviously an issue. Uh, flooding, you know, being, being right near a river or because of the fact that, you know, they had all this equipment out there and that could be affected. Onset, and then, you know, that was August, September, October. Then in November, you know, we didn't have a whole lot of snow in November, but then, you know, the winter stuff started becoming a factor. Frost, that would be a slipping hazard on many different things. And then obviously onset of heavier wintry precipitation, you know, heavy snow or freezing rain, that type of stuff. So, so all those things, you know, essentially we were giving them a heads up to the field, all the people out in the field with these radios that these hazards, you know, weather-wise were coming at them. So now we'll talk about the support from the forecast offices. From the weather service uh, forecast offices, the spot, a lot of the forecasts were actually produced in the offices. That's because they had many, many more resources. At the incident command post, we had a decision support laptop with a lot of different programs on there, but we didn't have nearly the resources for doing our regular forecast. So what would happen is the forecasters in the forecast office were you know, doing a lot of the forecast. Then they would ship them either via email or we had a server that we were sharing. 
and we would put them then together at the incident command post, and then we would be the face to brief those to the people. So, and really to be honest, as busy as we were in that 18, 16, 18 hours, we didn't have a whole lot of time to make our own forecast because we were running around, we were trying to fulfill these resource or requests, all those types of things. So, you know, we really had to have a lot of trust with the forecasters that were developing the forecast in the offices. Weather data was collected, you know, from the office. We didn't have nearly the resources down there to collect archive data or whatever that people wanted or hydro data. Unique requests, just, you know, anything, you know, again, we had very limited resources with us, but the main reason that we were there at the incident command post is so that we could be a face of the weather service and we could answer any questions that those people had out there. You know, we were essentially like a liaison, you know, between the people on the ground at the oil spill and, you know, the, the National Weather Service in general. And then obviously coordination on hazardous weather, you know, if the people at the office saw, you know, a tornado, you know, possibly coming nearby, you know, they would coordinate that with the person at the incident command post and then, you know, the, it could be passed on. Then at the River Forecast Center, River forecasts were produced, river modeling was conducted, oil travel times downriver were calculated, and then we had also various requests for them also. Some of the highlights, I would say some of the weather highlights as far as the incident command post was concerned. Um, the initial river information, you know, the, the stages of the, you know, the flows, those types of things, those were all very important things, you know, to get the response and get the support started. Then I would say the next thing that kind of came up was the heat that we had in August. We had many 90 degree days. We had many days that the heat indices were quite high. And that was, that was a big problem down there. I mean, that was some of the things that they did, you know, they were worried about every day was the heat. And it was again because of that gear that they had to wear. Up here on the left hand, or upper left hand corner, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, September 21st, we had a line of thunderstorms come through. Here in Grand Rapids, we actually gusted, I wanna say we had a gust to almost 70 miles an hour right at the airport measured. Um, same thing down there. And so we actually had one of the meteorologists from the Detroit office down there at the time. She actually was off duty, but she called the incident, incident command post, or she called the incident commander on his cell phone and said, you got 70, 80 mile per hour winds heading toward that. You have trailers there. You know, it was a concern of, you know, anybody that was there. So that was probably one of the highlights that, you know, as far as our support was concerned. And then on uh, October 26th, you wouldn't think in the end of October uh, that you'd have tornado threats. But, you know, we had this, we had the very warm weather that weekend before. It was 70 degrees. We had this strong system coming in. And I don't even know if we ended up having any reported tornadoes that day. But the atmosphere was just right that, you know, something could spin up at that point. And we saw a few clues on the radar. You know, that was, I think, the day that Kent County ended up on, under a tornado warning. Uh, the hospitals, you know, kind of evacuated to the hallways and stuff. But um, they had one right here. He had a little, it's like a little S shape there in the um, line. And there was a circulation kind of heading right toward the incident command post. So that was definitely a big thing, too. Um, so those were probably four of the bigger things, you know, as far as, you know, the weather was concerned at the incident command post. But, you know, there were so many different things. This is a picture of the trailers from the ground level. I showed you the overview from the uh, helicopter that they took the pictures. But these were some of the trailers. They brought those in and, you know, they were makeshift offices type of thing. So um, some of the numbers that we had. We were on site at the incident command post for 104 days, and that was from July 30th through November 8th. As of today, 195 days of support, and that's gonna to continue to tally. Um, my guess is at least into April. 21 different uh, meteorologists or hydrologists supported the incident command post, and those were from different offices, including ours and Detroit's. And then we had dozens of other people supporting, you know, from other offices, the River Forecast Center and Central Region Headquarters. You know, this was truly a team effort. You know, the people obviously at the incident command post were the faces to the, you know, the people cleaning this up and organizing the cleanup spill and the response. But I'll tell you what, you know, 
all the people in the forecast offices, you know, at ours, Detroit's, the River Forecast Center, and the Central Region headquarters, and then, you know, even going to the other offices that some of those meteorologists came from, filling in some of those shifts. There were so many people, you know, that really played a part in this, and it, it couldn't have been done without them. It was, it was definitely a big effort. Just a couple more slides here, a uh, couple of mis miscellaneous thoughts. You know, I mentioned, you know, the 16, 18-hour days. They were long days, but I'll tell you what, they went by real quick, and it was, it was a very rewarding day. You know, when you got done, you were tired, you're like, oh, I just want to go hit the bed. But I'll tell you what, you know, you felt like you did something real good and that you were very, you know, integral part of that. Conditions, duties, uh, we're in a state of flux through the first few days. I mean, it was like, we, <laughs> it was kind of funny because we would come up with a duty list every day and that had to be, you know, updated every single day because we had a couple new things come in, a couple things that they didn't need anymore. It was in a constant state of flux. So you, we all, you know, if say you had been off for a couple of days, you worked at the ICP one day and then were off for a couple of days, you had to really kind of do your homework ahead of time, read and see what the latest was because things were constantly changing. I mentioned this, but the Unified Command wanted simple to the point briefings. You know, I, I mentioned we could give, you know, a full two hour dissertation, you know, briefing on, you know, how and why, but they didn't want that. They didn't care about that and they didn't know about all the fronts and things like that. They just wanted to know what the weather was going to be. Very simple. And, you know, I showed you it was only four frames, essentially, or four briefing slides. Mentioned here, very rewarding work. Uh, the command and general staff were very pleased with our services and continue to be so. They, they haven't been able to tell us enough, you know, how much they've appreciated us and, you know, how much, you know, they really think that we did a good job. So, The workload, uh, you know, Bill, our uh, treasurer, he was on the first day that all this was going on. I think it was probably a day that he probably doesn't want to relive. It, uh, you know, we had severe weather, we had communication problems in the office, and then we had this going down. And, you know, the, I mentioned a little bit earlier, you know, it, this could not have been done without all the people in all the offices. You know, it wasn't just the people down at Marshall, but it was all the people. It was very taxing, and we found that, you know, we almost probably needed an extra person just at the office to handle all the different requests and everything like that. So, but, you know, it all worked out. So I just have a couple frames here with some pictures, more pictures. Uh, this is a picture as they were taking the pipeline out. That was, I think, around, uh, that picture is August 7th, I believe. Um, that was quite a coordinated effort because, you know, obviously there was an investigation. They wanted to know why the pipeline broke. So, you know, like all the different agencies wanted to be on site as that was being pulled out just so that nobody, you know, tampered with or, you know, messed up evidence, you know, that they were going to use to try and figure out what happened so they could stop it from happening again. Here's a picture. You can see all the boom around there. You know, many different types. You have yellow, you have white, you have orange. You know, they all have different purposes and do different things. Here's just some, you know, vegetation, some uh, you know, floodplain that the water got into, and then, you know, the water oil mix, you know, so they're kind of doing some work in there. And then here you can see some workers. You see some of the protective gear that they're work or using. This is, this is nothing. They're not really in any suits. They're just kind of using breathing masks. But they're kind of monitoring the benzene levels, so... And as I had mentioned, you know, just because there's snow, they didn't know how much work they were going to be able to do during the winter time, so they didn't really plan on much, but they did find that they were able to do some things, so they've actually continued working. I would say they're probably at, you know, maybe 10% of what they had during the peak. I would say they had, um, from seeing the numbers, they had probably over 2,000 people working on the oil spill during the peak of it in August. Now, I think that number's down to about 200. And some of that is administrative staff, just kind of supporting, you know, the other people that are out in the field. But you can see the creek there. That's Talmadge Creek there. Uh, this is one of their areas where they kind of decontaminate stuff and stage things. There, uh, this is out in some vegetation. What they did in some places, they had to get some heavy equipment out there. They actually laid these, like, pieces of wood, big planks and stuff, so that the, you know, big machines could go out there and not sink right in. 
So that's one of the things they have there. And then I believe this is the Ceresco Dam. This is near Battle Creek. Um, but you know, there were pictures earlier where you could see the sheen going right into the dam and right through it. You know, so it's quite interesting. Quite interesting to say the least. So that's all I have. Uh, can I answer any questions on what I've gone through here tonight? Hopefully, I didn't bore everybody. But yes. Uh, there were some health concerns early on with the benzene rally. And yeah. Sure. Um, the wind roses, I don't know if you, saw, if you remember those in the presentation. Um, essentially what we would do is we have these little, we, we have these tools. It's uh, kind of like a little model that they will run sometimes. But we, we kind of put in where the location of the spill was. or you know, And then we also have an option to put what kind of contaminant or what kind of you know, poison, toxin, whatever is there. Um, the substance essentially. And with those different substances that they have, they can actually, they have the um, makeup of that. So they know how dense it is, you know, those types of things. So all those things are put into it and then it ingests weather data. And it kind of tries to forecast out uh, up to like 24 hours. So I think the, the winds are prob probably the biggest factor where the winds are gonna blow that contaminant. But also two things, you know, like, you know, humidity plays a factor because some of the, you know, some of the contaminants could be a little bit heavier, a little bit lighter. Um, you know, so those are some of the things and they try to model. So it's trying to get an idea of where that contaminant's gonna go. And in this case, it was mainly the benzene, I think. And so that way they could take that information, see where that's gonna go. And then they would look at evacuating those people that the wind in those places, you know, would blow that benzene and cause issues, so. Is that data No, that's, that's something we have internally. Um, and that's, you know, support that we have, you know, we, we, we support many different things, um, you know, but it, it's something that they've developed and it's, you know, like password protected and all that. And it's not a public thing, but, you know, we work with emergency management, you know, quite closely. If they have a spill of some sort, you know, they call us, they also have their own resources to use, but you know, they call us also and see, you know, what we think is going to happen and what they need to do to protect the public, so. Does, does Enbridge have that data or do, do they, is it just with you that they have? Excuse me. Does, does Enbridge have that data, the wind roses or? Enbridge and the EPA were working together. So essentially, you know, we were giving it to both of them at the same time. So it was a coordinated effort. Where, where were the winds generally blowing at that time? Do you happen to remember? It was I think, you know, the prevailing winds are usually, usually from the west, but it depends on the systems going through, you know, that type of thing. So I couldn't give you any specifics, and, and it, it was variable. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? What were the main lessons that the Weather Service learned? Is this one of the bigger deployments they've had other than Katrina or something like that? And what kind of lessons, if this were to happen again, do you think you'd go into the, into the incident with? We, uh, the meteorologist and I, or the meteorologist in charge and I were actually talking about this today. I think one of the things that we learned was, you know, that things were very uncertain as far as how long we needed to look at staffing, um, you know, what we needed down there, the response. Uh, the staffing in the offices because of the fact that, you know, there were so many things that we relied on the office for that we needed extra staffing there, you know, and sometimes, and we didn't, we didn't necessarily staff up for it, you know, in the initial parts, but we eventually, you know, as we had severe weather, we brought an extra person in just to kind of watch over that area and stuff. So those were some of the bigger things. Um, and, you know, I think that's actually still being worked on by Dan. So. Any other questions? Yeah, Craig. Uh, since, uh, uh, <clears throat> since most of these items that you gave them on your forecast slides and your briefing slides and your spot forecasts mm -hmm. are available on your website on an hour-by-hour -hour basis, 
how necessary do you think it was that somebody like you was always on site for that long a time? It's a very and good question. I am chat so available you could have briefed them remotely. Right. Mm -hmm. the, you're very right. Most of that data is available. Um, but the problem is, is that most of those people didn't know where to go to get it. And then, you know, they have that data, but then it's almost like, you know, you have somebody there to explain it. And, you know, the forecast process was just a part of it. The other part was, you know, if they needed different things, you know, like they were trying to get, they were trying to model the river flow. They didn't, you know, really have something, but, you know, we were able to steer them in the right direction to find that information. You know, so I think, you know, and the other problem too is that, you know, the forecast data that we have out there, it's all over the place. But we could kind of concentrate it, put it in a package that, you know, it was essentially, you know, all there for, you know, them to see, and we can explain it if they had any questions also. So I, I feel like it was very important to have somebody there, you know, especially when everything was going, you know, and very much in a state of flux. And I think, you know, eventually it was the right thing to do that we started doing it remotely because, you know, at that point they didn't have any more requests. You could tell that, you know, things were just getting a lot more quiet for the people that were down there at the incident incident command post. So we didn't need to dedicate somebody, you know, after things had settled down a bit. So any other questions? Well, good. I hope everybody enjoyed it. You know, it's a very interesting topic. Um, and, you know, very interesting thing to go down there. You saw a lot, you know, and we were involved with the, some of the bigger meetings, you know, with the incident command staff. And it was very interesting to hear, you know, them kind of manage the, manage the event. So but I want to thank everybody for coming out. All right. Well, thank you, Nathan, very much for that presentation. <clears throat> and uh, at this time, we're just going to kind of wrap things up. Uh, it's just about 8.30 here tonight.